Hi, everyone. I am Michaela Bedard from the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation. Thanks for watching the video. I'm here with Dr. Chris Ritchie. We are in her beautiful, lovely, and calming office here in Wilsonville, Oregon, which is Revitalized Health and Wellness. And she's here to give a presentation to us today. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching and listening. And I uh, hope you'll have some good information for you today. So we're going to switch over here to a PowerPoint presentation that she has put together for us, which has a lot of information about natural medicine, the ways that it can be part of your treatment routine, and also part of your recovery from treatment. So hopefully um, this will be helpful to you. And you can always ask us any questions via email or contact us anyway after you've seen this, and we will be sure to get back to you to answer any of your questions. Um, we'll just start out, I'll just tell you just a little quick something about myself and then we'll get right on to you here. Um, my education, I have a, a number of degrees. Uh, I went to Portland State University and I have a double major in human biology and health science health education. I did get my doctorate of naturopathic medicine in 2008 here in Portland. And I also have a master's of public administration, health administration, and then I've got another master's degree that's just about finished in conflict resolution. So, oh yes, I just love education. <laughs> a little bit of an education junkie there, but uh, just love it. So um, I have two uh, locations that I practice. I am uh, at Revitalized Health and Wellness in Wilsonville. I own this clinic. I'm there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturdays. And then I also practice at Urban Wellness Group in Southeast Portland, 49th and Division, uh, Mondays and Fridays. All right, so it really does take a collaborative team, as I'm sure you've, you've probably figured out by now, to, to work with people who've been, been diagnosed with cancer and sarcoma uh, is, is certainly no different. So uh, you've most likely visited with an oncologist, perhaps the radiologist, surgeons, and, and gotten the consults, or maybe had treatment already. Naturopaths are a great addition to that team, as well as acupuncturists, uh, interesting new uh, information coming out about uh, how, do, how do we do mind-body medicine, so biofeedback, hypnotherapy, and of course your family and your friends and all the people that really do want to help you, even if you don't want to accept the help at the moment, but, but everybody really does want to help. And of course, then we've got our nutritionists and, and definitely got to have a big shout out to the, the nurses on the team. And so uh, just real quickly, what's a naturopathic doctor? For any of you who may not know, we're not new. We were founded in 1896. We are a di really distinct profession where we look at taking the wisdom of nature from thousands and thousands of years and looking at what's going on with modern science and clinical observation in, in, tr in a relationship to treatments. So we are trained as primary care for providers, and uh, we can treat and diagnose and manage patients with all sorts of acute and chronic conditions. And uh, we are trying to look at the body as a whole with regards to what's happening physiologically, anatomically, and then body, mind, and spirit. Uh, we provide, uh, provide individualized treatment. I think that's what really makes us a little bit unique is that we don't have a one-size-fits-all treatment plan. It is what's happening with the person very unique situation at any given time. And then we wanna put the least harmful, most effective treatment plan together. And that takes into uh, account perhaps some other treatments that are uh, in, involved in it. And we'll actually talk about that again coming up here within this, this presentation. So um, in our, in, here in the United States and Canada, we are licensed in 22 states and five Canadian provinces, as well as, the, as DC and Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. We have a lot of things that we can draw from, a tremendous amount of uh, herbs, supplements, enzymes, et cetera. I do a lot of IV therapy, um, nutritional IV therapy, uh, uh, oxygen treatments, uh, nutritional, I'm heavy on nutritional counseling, stress and sleep improvement, and emotional and mental support, and definitely body movement. Very, very important. And if you're looking for a really good book out there, kind of a kind of across the, the lines for um, cancer therapies, I recommend this one called Outside the Box. It's written by um, Dr. Mark Stengler and Dr. Paul Anderson, both who've been doing cancer therapy for, I think collectively between the two of them, maybe 50 years in the natural side of things. So it's a great resource. And we'll put a link to where oh, you could get that perfect. book yeah. in the notes. Yep. 
Uh, some of the conditions that we treat uh, are a lot of uh, treatment and disease side effects. So you, I'm sure some of you may have come, run across anemia or neutropenia. Um, the minute that we get uh, chemo in the picture, which is an important treatment, uh, we have some problems usually with being able to absorb nutrients across the gut because uh, a lot of the medications will affect all the cells in the body. So we've got to figure out what, what are we going to do, or, or if you just don't feel like eating. You know, there's lots of things we have to kind of figure out with this. Um, of course, the rashes and the sores, uh, hormonal imbalances. I see a lot of diabetes pop up. It's transient, but a lot of diabetes come up, maybe hypertension, uh, a lot of liver inflammation. We, we can go in and sort of kind of calm those systems down while we allow other medications to work on a targeted uh, cell pattern. All right, so one of the things that I am really working diligently to sort of overcome is that there is professional bias with between um, standard of care and integration or natural medicine. And we can kind of expect that. I mean, just it, just in our own fields, the, the amount of knowledge is tremendous with which we have to, to study and, and spend. I've spent thousands of hours studying outside of school, um, various therapies from around the world. And what I want to encourage everybody, and that's, you know, other doctors, uh, patients, is to first of all, be open-minded about things that maybe you don't know so much about. I'm, I'm as open-minded on, on chemos and radiation, although I'm pretty, pretty well-versed in those. Um, we just have to be open-minded and we have to work together so that we can safely integrate pharmaceutical medicine. Um, the cancer patients around the world are the largest condition-based consumer of integrative medicine. That's a big deal. Approximately 80% of cancer patients are using natural medicine. So it really becomes an ethical issue. And I think very clinically disappointing if we have a at cross purposes situation between two colleagues, between two different kinds of, of uh, care systems. And oftentimes just the oncologist may not be aware of positive values of natural medicine and, and may not have honestly have time to, to look at it, and, it, and it's not their their field of expertise, and that's okay. That's you know, and that's why we have each other is so that we don't have to be the jack of all trades and perhaps master of none, but we've just got people who are really really good at what they do and to work together. Um, the thing that I do run into, and I I try very quickly to to alter this or to change this, is that if a somebody in standard of care has made a disparaging comment about natural medicine and patients are he are definitely using the natural medicine or heading in that direction, they simply will stop telling the oncology team what they're doing. And that is, is dangerous. So I just encourage, you know, open communication. I do my best to relay information to on the oncologists if there's questions. So we always have to ask our question uh, with regards to supplements and herbs and other uh, uh, phytonutrient supplies that we have available. Um, there has been extensive research conducted around the world on the benefits of these uh, particular elements, treatments, and for supporting cancer care, uh, immune support, tissue repair, et cetera. And um, it, it's nothing new. It's been, uh, some of these have been used for thousands of years. So we just uh, are making sure that we can sort of pull the wisdom out of that knowledge and put it, put it into play to help people. Um, and there are many countries around the world that do incorporate natural medicines as part of, of standard of care. Um, and uh, one of the things we look at, and I think that I think why that some of these things um, are put into play is that most of the developed countries, they pay for health care with tax dollars. And so they're looking for a lot of prevention alternatives or ways to perhaps strengthen uh, people's uh, physiology uh, when they have been ill. Uh, a little more quickly than if we didn't address that at all. So I would start with this when I have somebody sit in front of me is that I, I kind of run from the innate uh, thought that we have the ability to heal ourselves if given the proper support. And yes, I know there are other arguments about that, but that's, that's, those are sometimes special cases, but we are designed to heal. And, and in, in holding that, uh, Kind of as part of the body mind medicine but these are the things that we can control to an extent 
we, we can sleep and you need a lot of sleep when you're sick. You've got to have at least eight hours. And if you can do eight to 10 is even better. That's how the body heals. Um, lots and lots of important research out about sleeping and, and good health. You have to move your body. And we'll talk about that coming up here in a couple of slides. Nutrition. I know, and there's all, you know, there's all kinds of fad diets out there, all kinds of misinformation about nutrition, but it is fundamental to our health in this world today. Stress management, you already have stress. You or a family member's been diagnosed with a, a, a very serious disease. We have to, to kind of calm that stress response down for other things outside of that so that we can get the chemicals in your body that respond to stress to relax so that uh, the immune system isn't trying to also repair you from stress. Social factors, you need to be, to be surrounded right now with the people who are the most supportive. And if there are people who are not supportive, that you have the ability to maybe just let them go away for a little while while you're going through treatment, um, that is actually not a bad thing. We can do it very kindly, but you need to have all hands on deck, everybody supportive around you. The other one we look at is environmental toxins. And that's something even as simple as looking as, at what's in your shampoo bottle. Sometimes uh, there's a lot of additives, not sometimes, a lot of the times there's additives and preservatives in those particular formulas that have been, you know, there is a lot of argument about it out there whether or not they really are as safe, but think about it this way. You're standing in your shower, in your bathtub, hot water, pores wide open, and you're putting these chemicals on your body. Perhaps for somebody who's got a compromised immune system, that might not be the, quite the right thing we should be doing. So we do take a look at those kind of things too and just clean everything up. Let that immune system go after the cancer cells. Um, and then genetics, at this point, we, it, it's still fairly new and trying to figure out it is the wave of the future for healthcare. Uh, it's not, not something we can do a lot about, but it of course has a huge play in the, in the system. Now I wanna talk a little bit about movement and dare I say the E word, exercise, and sarcoma in particular, because sarcoma is generally runs through connective tissue. And if it is uh, compromised in any way, um, we add another element to the ability to not heal very well. And so this is actually from the National Foundation of Cancer Research. So you can go on there too. They've got a fabulous blog for sarcoma patients and why it is so important to, to get some exercise, stretch your body. Um, one of the things we do when we move is we force the body to sort of break down and rebuild, break down and rebuild. And that will allow you know, new cell life to, to happen. It'll allow uh, the fascia, which is the little thin layer between the muscles, um, sometimes that can, can get stuck. And we allow that to start moving a little bit better. Also, it allows your lymph system to move. And then the other thing too, is if there's any tight, tightness or dysfunctional movement over any part of a tumor, it can actually create more pain or discomfort over a tumor area. So it is important that you get some movement. There are two things we look at uh, for sarcoma patients. Definitely it's strength and endurance, and you want a little bit of each. Endurance is just a bit of cardio. It's getting your heart moving a little bit. And it isn't necessarily getting uh, running. You know, you don't have to run a marathon. It's brisk movement, which could be just dance movements. I often tell people it's, you, you need a minimum of 30 minutes uh, of brisk movement at least five times a week. And, you know, in, in the Northwest here where it's kind of dark and gloomy or, or dark early, um, what I usually tell people is pick a sitcom that you don't have to pay a lot of attention to. It's 30 minutes long. Your brain, especially if you're resistant to exercise, your brain's gonna know, okay, Here's my start time, and I know there's a stop time coming up. And just, just do free body movement. If you, are, if you are bedridden or in pain, move some arms, move your leg, move something to sort of allow the body to start working well with the movement. The strength training um, is also very important. It's trying to minimize uh, fascial stress or the ways that the little, the little, um, uh, coating of your muscles and, and whatnot um, moves. You're trying to, to, to and, and reduce some joint compression. And again, everything is, is, is gentle. You, if you have not done any movement in some time, you certainly work up slowly. You do not overstress your body, but you do need to move a little bit. All righty, so here's a couple of things. Um, 
all my treatments are specific to each patient. And so in, in this beginning little webinar here, I've, I've been a little careful not to put too many things out there uh, that somebody could just kind of take and run with only because I want to make sure that you're getting the right type of supplements or medicinals that go with what's going on with, with any treatment that you're on. But uh, during radiation treatment, one of the things that's very helpful is melatonin. And uh, there's quite a wide range of doses on that. Um, and that does need to be coordinated with the doctor because we'll go as high as 20 milligrams, but you really do need the doctor involved at that point. And what it's doing is it does help re reduce um, some adverse effects from the radiation treatment. It does help protect your GI tract. Um, and it does help with sleep and the biorhythms that really need to, to be working to help you heal. Curcumin is another important one. It helps reduce inflammatory responses. It does, uh, lots of research out there showing up that uh, along with radiation will increase apoptosis of those cancer cells while protecting the normal cells. Zinc uh, citrate, I prefer the picolinate um, at a smaller dose, uh, 15. I prefer 15 milligrams, but you can go up to 25. Uh, I do it two or three times a day with anybody with a chronic illness. In the case of uh, treatment with radiation when there's been dermatitis or mucositis, um, it does uh, help reduce that. Sometimes it'll, it'll just cure it all together, but it does reduce it, in, uh, boost your immune function, et cetera. So the thing with it is I did stress at each meal, don't try to take zinc on an empty stomach because it'll make you nauseous. Um, so, and especially if anybody's doing uh, radiation to head and neck, this is really a mandatory treatment for that. Okay, now I, I mentioned curcumin on the slide before, but I do, it, it is a it is one that I see pop up a lot out there. It is a very, very important nutrient, but it is a little misunderstood. So curcumin is from turmeric. And if you're just doing turmeric, I do get a lot of people that, oh yeah, I bought a bag of turmeric and I'm putting it in pills or I'm putting it in, in foods. Great. Problem is, is turmeric is not bioavailable. Maybe 10 to 25% is going to go across your gut. And bioavailability means how can I get it in my body? And if it's not bioavailable, bioavailable, we got a little problem. So um, anywho, there have been two forms that have been engineered out there to increase the bioavailability. And one of them is called Mariva. And I think Italy was the first uh, country to come up with a Mariva form. And it will actually, and that's not a brand name, it's just a curcumin that's in the Mariva form. And it will take bio bioavailability up 80 to 99%. That's quite a bit, bit, bit of a big difference between 10 and 25. Another one that we've seen, uh, whether it's labeled turmeric or curcumin, and I do prefer the curcumin is the healing element in there, um, is it's got something called bioperine. And that is an engineered form of black pepper that helps the curcumin cross the gut wall. It's really about how do we get, how do we come up in the gut, in the area that things can be absorbed, knock on that cell and get across into the bloodstream. And we, if, cause it, if it doesn't happen, it's not going in. You just wasted a lot of time and money and effort. And so bioperine, again, you will see some curcumin out there just says black pepper in it. Not the same. Got to be the, the engineered bioperine. Okay, chemotherapy and natural op options. So my goal or our goal, because we work as a team here in this clinic with the, with the patient and the doctor and the other support system, is that our goal is to support the body and, that, and support that immune system to survive chemo and enhance its it's because we do have uh, many, many things that will actually enhance uh, the chemotherapy treatment, which if you're going to put yourself through that, and, and many of us need to, um, you certainly want it to work. And then I want to put in here that just because something's natural um, does not mean that it's compatible with, with treatments that you may on. It may, uh, may hinder some of the treatments. You really need to get guidance for it. Also, it doesn't necessarily just mean it's safe just because it's natural. And I do see a lot of that where people are taking some things that I, I try not to raise eyebrows, but I kind of think, okay, well, we're gonna talk about that before you leave today. So um, for instance, um, selenium is a big one that, that shows up with cancer patients. And um, oftentimes cancer patients are deficient in selenium. Now, when you're looking at 200 micrograms daily, that's a very high dose of selenium. Going over that can cause harm. Um, NAC, 
um, N-acetyl, uh, N-acetylcysteine is another one that we use quite a bit with cancer patients, and maybe not for the cancer, but if they've got cold or flu or other things that come into play here, but it can't be taken during chemotherapy. Um, so those are some of the things we look at. Uh, St. John's wort, and anybody who's in therapy probably knows grapefruit is sort of a no-no with a whole lot of treatments out there, and it has to do with how your liver works. And it will either make a treatment more potent than it needs to be or less potent. And again, certainly a waste of your time and harmful to your body. Uh, one of my uh, one one of my go-to treatments here with peripheral neuropathy, as well as some other wonderful side benefits, is our lipoic acid. Um, in order for me to work with it with something like a peripheral neuropathy, I have to use doses that you would uh, see higher than uh, um, you know normal packaging. So it's got to be done with guidance from an MD. But very, very effective. So that's that's an important one. Okay. Um, with regards, again, back to chemotherapy, there are specific natural protocols for each one of the, the chemotherapy agents or the combinations. And, in, and it's different for each cancer line. So it isn't just a one size fits all. We have to, to it take it take me a couple hours oftentimes to come up, especially with that first treatment plan. And then each time we have a maybe a drug change, we, we, we alter the treatment so that it's, it's uh, supportive for the patient and definitely not harmful. And we definitely want to increase the effectiveness of all treatments that you're on and reduce side effects. That's uh, rather important there. Okay, there is a, a article, a number of articles related to sarcoma and whether it's physiological stress or mental stress. stress. The sarcomas are particularly susceptible to it. So when I talked a little bit earlier about making sure that we can come up with ways to de-stress, and I'll talk about that again here in a second, to de-stress somebody with sarcoma, um, we can actually take some chemical, tone down some chemical processes in the body that contribute to the growth of that cancer. Same thing goes on with if you've got inflammatory processes, maybe you're diabetic or, or high cholesterol, or hypertension, um, osteoarthritis. There's lots of things that contribute to inflammatory stress in the body. And what we wanna do is, is go in and, and, and focus on that stress, that inflammatory stress and take it down. And so that, that we can um, then work with the body while it's trying to heal sarcoma cells um, or fight them. And then same thing with the other medications you might be on. All right, I have something that I have been using, gosh, I've used them myself for a couple of decades, but I've definitely put my, all my patients across the board, anybody's dealing with a chronic illness um, or has had a particularly rough family life um, or other, other events that have happened in their life that are profound. Um, I call them the three journals. And without fail, all of my patients who have done this work have fared better than the ones who do not. And so I call them, I call them the journals. I use the term loosely. In fact, I only have one of the quotation marks on there. That's how loosely I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I call them purge, forgive, and grateful. And I'll, I'll address the first two to start. So purge is you sit down in a room all by yourself with a blank piece of paper and a writing utensil, and you start just kind of letting anything that, that is tr causing you trouble out. And it may, and, and, and women are particularly a little bit reluctant to do this because it might be all of a sudden this word will come out, I hate my spouse or I hate my kids. You don't hate them. But if that comes up, something in there was festering. Get it out, write it down, write it down, write it down. There's something about the, the, the brain and the hand connection of writing things down and you just keep running on themes until at that, for that particular time that you're doing it, you're done. It could be that you feel relief. You could feel sad. You just feel like, okay, I'm, I, I can't take any more for the moment. And when you're done, you destroy that paper. I like, I like burning them. I like burning the paper. There's something I think very symbolic about uh, uh, smoke going up into the skies. Um, please don't do it in the house because your smoke detector won't like it. However, um, and then you just keep doing this. Anytime that you've got something coming up that just sort of sits with you, go purge it. Get it out of your body. Now, forgive is a similar thing. 
we don't have to forget. In fact, it's often good that we don't forget some of the things that have happened to us because we can learn from some of the, the things that have caused us some pain. But if you've got something that's causing you to be angry, pained, or anything less than truly joyous, you got to get that out of there. Oftentimes, there's people who have come along knowingly or unknowingly by them who have caused us some mental harm or emotional harm. And oftentimes, they're long gone. Could be a parent that's passed away. Could be, you know, an old, uh, an old boy or girlfriend or somebody that's, that's just hurt us, but they're long gone. They don't remember. They could care less. But if we are still stuck in the memory of what's going on and it still causes us to have a visceral reaction, they're in control, not us. And we right now need to pull back all of our, so all of our control, all of our power. So this is the same way you sit down and you forgive and you may have to forgive somebody a thousand times or more before you can think about the event and it's like watching a movie, but it doesn't you, you don't feel your gut clench or your shoulders go up um, or a headache or whatever the symptoms are for you. This one is also destroyed. And I'll tell you why I have people destroy both of these. If anybody thinks that somebody can find out about these things, if they, especially if they're deep, dark secrets, uh, people won't write them down. And I need you to get all of it out. And so that's why I have people destroy them. Now, the Grateful Journal, and I think I've, I was looking the other day, I've had mine over 30 years now, and it's, I keep it in the bedside stand, and it's a little spiral-bound notebook, and I have, luckily haven't had to use it for some time, but there have been days where I wasn't sure I was, how I was getting out of bed. Life was just throwing me some curveballs, and they were not good ones, and so I could, I would, in order to be able to move or to get some sense of self and power back, I would just sit down and I'm grateful for running water. I'm grateful I have a roof over my head. And you could kind of see how I came out of basic need into I'm grateful for a supportive family, the roses in my garden, et cetera. But, but all three of those together, I can't begin to tell you how powerful they are. Um, they're, of course, mind-body connection. But if we just look at chemistry, you've got all kinds of chemicals moving through your body that are stimulated with the endorphin system, which is what makes you feel happy and relaxed. Um, that supports your immune system. It just really powers it up. All righty, so we're getting to the end here. So you probably have been told, and if you haven't, I'm, I'm gonna reiterate, cancer is unforgiving of mistakes and time wasted. It, it, we are, we, we are kind of working with, with the clock. Um, so don't self-treat with natural medicine. There are plenty of websites out there that are happy to give you information or somebody's you know, special story, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, don't take advice from people who are not un unlicensed. I, I even go there or multi-level marketing. They're trying to, it's a lot of money in, in cancer patients who are trying to save their lives. And you know, even well-meaning friends really talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. They've studied it. They've spent thousands of hours learning their craft. Um, you deserve it and you need it. Um, naturopathic doctors were skilled in the art, art and science of all the interactions between the drugs and natural medicine, constantly looking it up, constantly seeing what new research is out there um, in order to personalize your program to help you as best we can. And um, last but not least, Dr. Google is not your friend. There are a multitudes of miracle diets, uh, you know, cure-all herbs and teas and do all kinds of protocols out there on the web. And I tell you, I don't use any of them or very few of them. And it's just because I cannot prove they work or I cannot prove they can work time and time again. And that being said, um, has it worked for some people? Maybe. The thing with those, with the extra, the blogs that are out there, uh, non-sanctioned websites, we have no idea who's putting that information on. We don't know if it's somebody that genuinely was ill and maybe they did have a, a miraculous remission. We don't know. Or is it somebody that's just needed to be in a group of people? They don't have a very good life. They just need to have that support. We have no idea. So really kind of keep yourself protected that way and be very, very wary and um, seek out help of, of people who know what they're doing. So I think that wraps it up for this one. I really want to thank you for your time and your healing journey. I do wish you exceptionally good health. 
And if there's anything I can do, let me know. And I think that we have, uh, Michaela has a couple of questions. I do have a couple questions here. Let me make sure that we can get you back in here. All right. Yep. Well, thank you, Dr. Richie. That was wonderful. My pleasure. I love that. Thanks um, for having me. I think what it really did was bust some myths about natural medicine, but also inform us or those of us that might be in treatment about how to find additional solutions. And I had two main questions that came up after listening to this. Um, the first is about coordinating natural care mm -hmm. with other care mm -hmm. that we might be receiving. I know that it's difficult, even in the best of circumstances, to coordinate different doctors mm -hmm. with each other. They don't have time. Mm -hmm. It's too hard to get them to talk. How do you get medical records shared? Do you have any tips and tricks okay. about how to do that if someone chose to use natural mm -hmm. medicine in addition to a more conventional treatment? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll sort of address a couple of the easy ones there. So with regards to records, not a problem. Um, we have to share. It's the law. We have 30 days to get records back and forth. and we. We're, we're really great about it here, and I know I've never had a problem with somebody getting me records, so that one's good. As far as coordinating care um, with, nat with, with natural care and standard care where there's any misunderstandings, it does happen. Um, I find that um, many of the oncologists, especially here in Oregon, uh, are probably ahead of the rest of the country in regards to understanding that there are their patients are going to be trying different things and and supporting that. And I actually I have a really long list I keep here of peer-reviewed journal articles with regards to each and every supplement. How does it work with a chemo drug? How does it work with radiation? How does it work inside the body? And I am always happy to provide those to the oncologist. Um, there, uh, you know, if you can imagine, you know, I've, I've spent, I don't know, 10,000 hours, I mean, thousands and thousands of hours uh, studying this. I can't even imagine somebody who's, who's taken that amount of time to study in their own wanting to take this on. So I'm, I'm more than happy to always share it. Um, and I am trying to figure out a way to make that a little more easy for, for the oncologist to take a look at, because we do, we work late, late, long days, late hours. And it is hard sometimes to, to be able to connect up, but we, we do try if we can. And that's vice versa, right? That you would want mm -hmm. to see all the treatment protocols that they're on yes. or have been on. Yes, I, I have to, um, because again, as we talked about earlier, uh, coming up with a treatment plan, I have to make sure everything is safe and that it doesn't work against something. It doesn't uh, uh, compound a treatment more than it's the dose it's supposed to be or, or to stop a treatment that's in play and um, other other conditions that the, the patient may have or other medications that they're on. So everything's gotta be very carefully crafted. Do you find that most of your cancer patients who come to you are mid-treatment or are they perhaps post chemo and radiation and coming to you for some healing work? You know, that is a great question. I, across the board, it's, it, it, it's just, it's all walks. Um, I probably, 33% of people who've just gotten the diagnosis and they're scared of, of maybe they've been scared by the, the appointment that happened um, and are concerned about the side effects for some of the treatments, I'll end up with them. And so we go over, we go over what's the importance of having radiation and chemo and, and surgery. I'm certainly not opposed to any of that. We have to use all the tools in the toolbox. And, uh, and then how can, what can I do to support them, whatever their choice is, um, yay or nay, um, with the standard of care. And then I get people who have, perhaps they've gone out of remission or they've been through treatment for, um, uh, you know, a couple of years and just something's just not quite working well. And so I've got those people. And then on the other end of the spectrum, they're in full on treatment right now. Um, and they're looking to support that. So kind of, I don't, I don't think there's one particular avenue that, that shows up in front of me more often. And do you find that you have um, pediatric patients as well yes. as adults in yes. treatment? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. yeah. Well, my last main question is about the E word. 
that you said oh, exercise. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Because we all know what it's like to be told that we have to exercise more. It's hard, especially when you are so busy and your life is chaotic for other reasons. Um, but I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about the importance of that. Yes. Um, I loved your idea of just doing body movement in front of a TV show. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you could explain a little bit why it's so important, especially for sarcoma mm -hmm. patients. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, we have these two wonderful systems in our body. All righty. And we are going to get permission now, and it's going to be a little backwards for you. So it does say cardiovascular, and it does say lymphatic system. And the cardiovascular system has, uh, is, is sort of the main pathway for us to get uh, nutrients around our body and to get wastes out of it. And it is run by this marvelous pump called the heart. Now, it's a beautiful system. And in order for things to get in and out of the body, the arteries meet up with the veins at a place called a capillary bed. Now, if you imagine, I always kind of imagine it like a, tr a fast train stop and the train just sort of stops very quickly. You got to get on and off and, and uh, in a short period of time, but it's not a perfect system. So sometimes there's excess baggage left on the platform. Maybe there's some extra passengers that don't need to be there. So the lymph system mirrors this system plus more uh, more track um, to clean it up. And so I always liken it to, you can see here how kind of clean that uh, red and blue section is on the cardiovascular where things are moving through. It's like I-5 or Interstate 5. And the other side where it's got node, pipe, node, pipe, no, it's a little bit more like Highway 99. So you got a lot of stoplights to go through. Now the thing with the lymph system, it is, it is, it's your immune system, plus it is a cleanup of the body. And so what it's trying to do is work all of the lymph substance back up, dump it into the heart so that it can be um, eliminated in waste through your body, through the cardiovascular system. If you are not moving, you can't move that system. So let me put it like this. So with the heart, it's pumping eight, that approximately 80 times a minute. The lymph system will move, let's say you're laying on the couch, it'll move eight times a minute just by breathing. But it was designed to be moved because your muscles were squeezing it to move upward to be able to, to um, deposit uh, everything into the heart, the fluids into the heart. So if you are not moving, I guess you could just look at it as you're sitting in your own waist. So if that's not a little bit of a, of a you know, motivation to, to move your body, it certainly should be and very helpful. And no, it will not spread cancer. To, to be able to move things through the lymph. That's been, I think, well, well debunked. So um, get out there, move that body, give yourself, it doesn't cost a dime, give yourself every opportunity to make your body even healthier while it is fighting you know, a very serious fight. I love that. that. I love that. that. It, it <laughs> makes me want to get out and I move know. my body. <laughs> so I'm not sitting in my own waist. Um, I think that's wonderful, especially for people dealing with connective tissue mm -hmm. issues, uh, yeah, because absolutely. it is so important to, mm -hmm. to keep them moving. Um, those are the only questions I had today, but uh, Dr. Ritchie, I'm sure we'll have more. Anytime. And Thank as you. people call an email in, a, uh, in response to this video with more questions, can we uh, throw them to you? Have yeah, you absolutely. More? Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. Ritchie. She has been a supporter and a friend of the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation um, and has treated a lot of sarcoma patients and is a, a wonderful resource for you all. So thank you. We will talk to you all again soon.